so a couple weeks ago, I had Krista schedule me a, an eye appointment, and it's not something I enjoy doing. I try to put it off, but my contacts were running out, and I was pretty, pretty sure my prescription was getting old. I stopped being able to see the note screen in the back about a year ago, so it was, it's probably time to upgrade, but I don't like going to, to the eye doctor. At first, you have to sit in that chair, and they got a shotgun puff of, uh, of air into your eye, and then you, know, you have to take a test that's designed for you to fail it. Uh, and then after all that's done, you go stand in a bunch of people trying on glasses that you're pressured to buy where you can't see how it looks because you have to take your glasses off to put them on. In fact, I had, I had someone a few weeks ago uh, pull off my glasses and they, they asked me, are you, you a big fan of the NBA? And I said, no, I care less about the NBA. Why? I said, well, then why are you sporting Shaquille O'Neal glasses? I'm like, what are you talking about? So they took them off and he pointed and sure enough, Shaquille O'Neal right there on the side. So... Uh, I had no idea. I couldn't see what I was trying on. But here's the thing about eyesight. It is a, a struggle. Being able to, to see clearly is really a big deal. I can remember the first pair of glasses I ever got. I was in fifth grade. and There were probably lots of uh, evidences that maybe I was struggling with my eyesight. I was struggling to take notes in math class. Couldn't see the, the whiteboard. Uh, I was struggling to uh, uh, walk, you know, walking into closed doors and things of that nature. But despite all the evidence, it wasn't until I started striking out on the ball field that my dad's like, maybe something's wrong. And so, so mom took me in, and, and she got me glasses there. It was my first set. And, and when I walked out of Walmart that first time with glasses, you know, one of the things that I remember intimately, it's not that I started spraying line drives all over the field again. It wasn't that, which is a big deal in Indiana, that apparently I wasn't the world's worst basketball player. Those, those aren't the things I remember. What I remember most was walking out of Walmart Eye Center and looking across the parking lot, and on the far edge of that parking lot were these giant boulders. There's nothing special about them. The only thing that was special about them was that they were there. And I'd never before seen them, but they'd been there the whole time. And so I, I can still remember the drive back from the eye center with my mom, and just pointing out all the things. We'd, we'd driven that road so many times, and I'm like, oh, look at that, look at that, look at that. All of these things that had been there the entire time, but I had no clue they ever existed. Now, here, here's what we're doing. We are finishing up really what's been six weeks talking about curses and blessings. We spent four weeks talking about hidden curses, things the world says are good but are actually bad. And we spent last week and this week talking about what we're calling hidden blessings, things the world says is bad but are actually good. And so last week we talked about the hidden blessing of poverty. And I told you that I didn't realize I was poor growing up. Somebody had to told me, tell me. Well, blindness is kind of the same way. You don't really realize what you can't see until somebody tells you that it's there. And so we have this idea when we're talking about these hidden blessings that the world says blindness in all of its forms, it's always going to be a bad thing. But what I want to ask this morning is, is that true? Is blindness always bad? Or is there a, a, a place where maybe there is this hidden blessing of maybe not seeing everything so clearly? Because here, here's what I propose to you. I propose to you this morning that we live in a world that is overwhelmingly nearsighted. We live in a world when it comes to especially talking about blessings in our life that the world only sees things that's right in front of them. You think about it, whether it's financial blessings, whether it's, it's your health and that's a blessing, whether it's, it's your relationship with people, whether it's, it's respect of your peers, whether, whether it's promotions at work, whatever these blessings are, they're right in front of us, and we can see them clearly, and we can call them out. It's, it's a very nearsighted approach to being blessed. But here's the problem. When we're nearsighted, we lose perspective of the things that are far away. We lose perspective of things that are ahead, and, and sometimes spiritually, I actually think it is more helpful to understand that we don't always have to know exactly what's happening now. We don't always have to see clearly exactly what's in front of us as long as we know what's coming. In other words, I actually think it's a hidden blessing to be farsighted. And so that's what we're going to look at this morning, except we're going to say it this way. The blessed life requires farsighted vision in a nearsighted world. Right? As Christians, sometimes being blessed means we walk in a murky present for the sake of having a clear future. And so we're going to look at that this morning. If you want to turn with me, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be reading verses 3 through 10. We started this last week. This is Jesus' first public sermon called the Beatitudes. And we'll review verse 3 and then we'll get into the new stuff for today. But verse 3, Jesus says this. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, we said last week, this is the beginning of a theological envelope. Verses 3 and 10 form for us. And so, 3 and 10 talk about present tense, or what we're going to call these kind of nearsighted blessings. And the nearsighted blessings of verse 3 and 10 is that we are in the kingdom now. And what that blessing means is this. We learned last week that, that, that his blessing isn't the result of our behavior. It's the reward of his. In other words, we're not blessed simply because we're good at being Christians. We're, we're blessed because he's good at being a savior. And so we learned that our blessings don't follow a change in behavior, that our, our behavior changes because of the blessings that we've already received. Right, so that's what we talked about last week. That is our very nearsighted vision that we have, our nearsighted blessing. But when we realize we're in that nearsighted blessing, it will impact. It will change our behavior. And so these middle verses... They're going to be about that changed behavior. And when we look at the changed behavior, we're going to realize really quickly that it's things that happen to us that the world would look at and say, well, that doesn't seem like a blessing at all. And so these middle ones, they're going to require this far-sighted vision for understanding the blessings of God. And so that starts with verse 4. And in verse 4, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, for they, notice, will be comforted. Okay, so now we've, we've transitioned to the middle part of this envelope. Now we're looking at our far-sighted blessings. And Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now when we think mourning, it's almost always, well, we experienced loss. Right? That, that's what mourning is in our language. Maybe a loved one passed away. And so we are in mourning. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Right? Jesus isn't talking about a circumstance. He's talking about a condition. He's not talking about a, something that happens to us. He's, he's talking about our heart. And we've had this theme for a few months now about self-inspection. And we've talked about we have to sometimes look inside. We have to self-inspect and see how our life matches up with the way that God has asked us and called us to live. And when we have that moment of self-inspection and we realize the depth of our own sin, that should bring us to a point of grieving, Right? When we realize the world around us has, has no recognition of God, has no recognition of Jesus, and the sin is rampant, that should bring grief into our life. That, that's what Jesus is talking about here. You know, when, when Krista went to the store this past week, she took Essie with her when I was eating lunch. And so that was kind of nice. I just had a, a few minutes. And, and I sat down to eat lunch, and I turned on the TV, and it recommended to me that I watch Agent Joe Kenda, Detective. Anybody seen that show? I know I murdered that name. That's okay. Tongue in cheek there. Um, but he, here, it's Homicide Hunter, Joe Detect, Joe Kenda, that's what it's called. And, and it was recommended for me because we used to live in Colorado Springs, and so I used to watch it when we were there because it was interesting because it happened in the city that we were in. But Chris doesn't let me watch true crime anymore because we've we got a one-year-old, so that's, that's probably a good idea. And so I sat down, like, I'm going to watch this episode. And so I watched this, this Homicide Hunter episode, and it was about an 80-year-old man, completely innocent, good family man, wonderful wife, kids that loved him. He and his, his spouse, they were in Colorado Springs visiting for the Pikes Peak Marathon. And one night, his wife got a headache, and so he decided to, to walk to the, the grocery store down the block to get her some medicine. And while he was walking there, there was a young 17-year-old man well, he'd have no criminal history. He'd never done anything violent before, but his family was struggling, couldn't make bills, and, and he decided he was going to try to rob someone to get the money. And so he came across this 80-year-old man, and the man didn't give him anything, and it just got out of hand. He, he didn't really know what he was doing, and, and the young man shot him and left him for dead. And eyewitnesses at the scene, here's what they said. They, they said he ran away from the scene, screaming at the top of his lungs, oh my God, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And in such grief, he, he, he forgot to, to even rob him. But here's what I want to talk about in that story. There was three types of grief present. Right? There was the grief of, of the new widow that, that just collapsed on the floor. The type of grief that, that brought her to the ground when she found out that her spouse was dead. There was the type of grief that the detectives had that moved them to action, that said, we're going to make this right. And then there was a third type of grief. When they brought the young man that was the suspect into the room for interrogation, since he was 17, his parents had to be in there with him. And when he looked at their eyes and their, their concern, and when the charges were being levied against him and he was denying it, 
And then the detective said, we have an eyewitness. To watch that young man's face as he realized the gravity of his mistake and that he was about to spend his life in prison. And when he turned to his parents, he said, I'm so sorry I did it. The look of grief in their face when they realized what was going to happen because they didn't raise their kid this way. That's the type of grief Jesus is talking about here. When both us and our Heavenly Father are grieved at our present condition because it was never his desire that we live this way, and yet here we are. To those people, Jesus says, when he comes back, they will be comforted. But you think about this grief, and, and you have this, this level of, of grief and mourning. You look at that, and if you're looking at it from a nearsighted perspective, that doesn't seem like a good thing. It only becomes a good thing when you look at it from a far-sighted perspective. When you see the blessing, not that we're in now for grieving, but that is to come because we are grieving our sinful state. But remember, these are all going to build on each other. And so Jesus goes on to the next one. and He says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And now, now this meekness, it's akin to the gentleness that we, we talked about a few weeks back, this supernatural humility. It's not about me trying to become better than someone else or more mature than someone else. It's about me trying to become more mature or better than I was yesterday. Right, that's that supernatural humility. It's not about comparing myself to others. It's about comparing myself to who I was yesterday, hoping to see this level of growth. Because here's what culture believes. Culture believes the rich, the powerful, the connected, those that do whatever it takes, that, that, that do whatever it takes to whoever it takes to get whatever they want. And right, that's the curse of sin at, at work in this world. To them belongs the world. Right? We believe that. But then Jesus comes in here and says, actually, it's the meek. That when I come back, they will receive the world. And listen, that doesn't feel like, if you're looking short term, right? If you're looking nearsighted, that doesn't feel good. That feels like a curse when, when you've been walked on, when you've been stepped on, when you've stepped aside, when other people have got where they've gotten because they've, they've done things to you. That doesn't feel good. But what Jesus says is let them have it. What Jesus said is this world is set to be destroyed. What Jesus says is there's sin in this world. And to them that want this world now, they can have it. But this is the only reward they'll get. He says to the meek, to those that are humble, to those that have spiritual humility and supernatural humility, to those people when I come back, then the world is theirs. And it's the world that you want. It's the reward you want. It's, it's not what they want now. So let them have it. So again, if you're, if you're nearsighted, that feels like a curse. But if you're farsighted, it's a blessing. And then he says this. He, he moves it to that which sustains us. And Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they will be filled. A food and water, that which sustains us. Because he says, again, he's building. He says, there are those that sustain themselves by what they can get out of this world. But instead, blessed are those that sustain themselves by wanting to live for God, who wanting to live for Jesus, who want to do things God's way. They will be blessed and they will be filled. There's this fun verse in, in John chapter 4 where Jesus is just starting his earthly ministry with his disciples and he's trying to teach them something. And they're walking through an area they don't normally walk through and they haven't eaten in a while. They haven't drank anything in a while. They're hungry, they're thirsty, they're weak, and Jesus sends the disciples off ahead to go find some food. And when they go off ahead, he sits down at a well to do some ministry with a woman that it seems like he's really specifically there to see. And it says the disciples come back. And the disciples say, Rabbi, you really, really need to eat something and Jesus' response to them is, is interesting. He said, I, I already have food that you know nothing about. And they go, what do you mean? Chick-fil-A is closed on the Sabbath. I'm paraphrasing here. And what Jesus says in response is so interesting. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. 
to do God's bidding because they will be filled. And listen, it's hard in our culture of excess to understand what it really means to hunger and thirst and to be sustained by food and and things when we have so many options. You know, the the biggest thing I can compare it to, I remember when I was a freshman in high school, uh, I had started moving away from wrestling and into doing baseball uh, year round. And earlier in the year I had qualified for state, but, but I had kind of stopped training because again, going to baseball. But then I found out my, my younger brother, who's 10 years younger, that he qualified for state. And so we had never wrestled in a tournament together. And so I decided to don the singlet one last time just so we could have this experience together. The problem with that was I hadn't been training for about four months. Listen, in baseball shape and wrestling shape, those are two very different shapes, right? And so I had four days to, to cut 18 pounds to get back in my weight class. And so we, we, did, we pulled out all the old tricks. Dad pulled out the trash bags underneath the sweats, rode the stationary bike with a heater on me, working out, doing all this schedule. And listen, as, as a high school boy, that stuff wasn't that bad. What was bad was the diet plan, <laughs> What was bad was that that I was allowed one rice cake per meal with three ice cubes to wash it down. And after four days of that, I was hungry. Those rice cakes and those ice cubes, they they just didn't satisfy. It didn't matter if I had the plain one or the one that had five more calories but had that caramel coating. It didn't matter. It did not fill me. But you better believe the moment that I weighed in and made weight. We booked it to Wendy's. I got a spicy chicken meal with large fries and a large sweet iced tea, and I downed it. And for the first time, again, perspective, but for a high school boy for the first time in ages, I felt full, and I felt satisfied. Now, 20 minutes later, I went to the hotel bathroom and vomited it because a number nine from Wendy's after four days of fasting is never a good idea. But listen, what Jesus says here. Those who hunger and thirst, who have that kind of longing, not for for temporary things, but to do the will of the Father, says to those people, they will be filled, and they won't be filled by fast food. They will be filled by something that is good and something that lasts. And so that's what Jesus said, and here's what's going to happen. We've covered the first four Beatitudes, and if you pay attention, you're going to find out real quick that the first four are kind of inner qualities. The first four deal with, with our heart and our inner motivation. But Jesus says, you know, it's, it's not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, it's what comes out of him. He's saying what, what comes out of you reveals what's really going on inside of there. And what comes out of us, if these inner blessings are good, is going to be a blessing not just to us, but it's going to come out of us and bless others. And so we're going to actually transition now, and the next four are going to be kind of these outer blessings, And he starts by saying this. He says in in verse 7, we'll cover these a little more quickly for the sake of time, but he says in 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He said, blessed are those of us that recognize the mercy we've been shown by God, and what we do is we turn that around, and no matter how anybody else treats us, we treat them merciful, because we've been shown mercy. And blessed, he said, are, are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Uh, the heart was, was the baseness of all emotion, of all action, all behavior in that culture. So blessed are those who have pure motivations, because for them, they will see God. And, and listen, I've always said, the Bible actually tells us we are to judge people. Right? We are to judge sin, we are, we are to judge action, we are to judge behavior. But the one thing we are not to judge, ever, is the heart. We are not to judge someone's intent. That's between them and Jesus. And see, when when you're going out and you're living this way and your behavior changes and and people assume all things about you, I don't know if your heart's right. I don't know if your heart's good. I don't know if you're using Jesus as a tool to get what you want or you're doing it for his glory, but do you know who knows it? He does. And when he looks in your heart and he sees that your motivation is pure and your behavior is for his glory and not your good, when that happens, guess what? One day, you won't see God in part. You will see him fully. And he says something real interesting. It's my favorite one. He says in verse 9, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And this is one of those times where we look at it and we say, what does he not say? He doesn't say, blessed are the peacekeepers. He said, blessed are the peacemakers. Those are two very different things. Because I've heard Christians for a long time say, well, I'm a a child of God because I stay out of it. 
because I walk away when there's conflict because I don't participate in it. That's spiritual apathy. That's not what Jesus says here. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who take action to insert themselves into the chaos created by sin. Blessed are those who bring the Prince of Peace into a situation where he wasn't before. Blessed are those that bring Jesus to a lost and hurting world. And listen, when that happens, do you know what's going to happen? Because remember, these build on each other. Look at verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And that closes our envelope, right? When we have all of these behaviors that begin to change, and we have all of these things that start to happen that don't feel good, that don't look good, that we don't understand, that we don't see clearly why it's happening when we are persecuted for bringing the Prince of Peace into a world of sin. You need to remember, you're already blessed. You're already in the kingdom. It's present tense, right? That, they bring, he brings us back. It comes full circle. See, all of these things, and especially those middle verses, but all of them, they are things the world says are bad, The world says they're curses, but if you're farsighted and if you're in Jesus, they're not curses. They are actually good. They are are hidden blessings. And what we can understand and what we realize when we are farsighted is we don't have to see clearly what's happening right now. I don't have to understand everything that's happening in my life right now. I don't have to understand why. I don't have to understand the what. I don't have to to know God's mind toward me for for why are you doing this to me? Why are you letting this happen? Why am I experiencing this? I don't have to have those answers. It can be murky because the future is clear. Because if I continue to, to, to allow my behavior to glorify God, I will be blessed. And it will be a blessing that is far greater than any earthly reward that I can ever get for myself. And so what becomes really important here is this then. We have to understand that if we want to live a blessed life, we have to have far-sighted vision in a near-sighted world. That's what keeps us in his blessing. And my friends, that's, that's our motivation. When you struggle to get up in the morning, when you don't know if you have it to keep going, when you don't have anything left to give, and you say, why, why do I bother? This is your motivation. Your motivation is that you are are both blessed now, you are in his grace, you are in his salvation, you are in his forgiveness, you are in his freedom now, and when you don't feel like doing something, when that doesn't seem like enough, you can understand too, listen, this is an investment. This is me storing up treasure in heaven because there will be a day when the earth is restored, there will be a day when Jesus comes back, and on that day, it will have been worth it. So let's, let's finish here by, by talking this. Let's, let's understand this kingdom principle really quick. See, the kingdom is, is a, lot like, a lot like these. T- tell me if you, anybody ever seen these candies? You know what they are? What are these called? Let's bring on the screen. What are these called? Now and laters. Who wants some now and laters? No, listen, friends, I've told you before, if you want candy when I bring it, you have to sit close, right? (laughs) Ever since the honey bun incident of 2019, (laughs) old lady got hit in the face in the back row. It wasn't good. (laughs) Hand those out. So here's the thing. (sighs) So when we talk about these candies, uh, here's what now and laters were. I got this directly off of, hey, you want to make the effort, my friend? You are rewarded. These now and laters, they were founded all the way back in 1962 by Phoenix Candy Company. And this is why they're called now and later. It says they were given that name to highlight their unique texture because when they were initially consumed, it was really firm. It required a lot of chewing, but the more that you chewed on it, the more it warmed in your mouth. And the more you chewed on it and the warmer it got, the easier it was to chew. And the softer it became, the more you enjoyed its many fruity flavors. So the name was meant to signify the experience of savoring the taste, but immediately or now and over time or later. And so I asked Krista to go, when she was at the store, Picked some of these up for me while she was there for the sermon. She couldn't find any anywhere. 
So we had to get online and, and look around and we found out the dollar store had some, but they don't sell them in individual packs anymore. They're a throw-in candy with other, with other fruity chewables. And so I was like, why, why don't we sell these anymore? I, mean, I remember enjoying these as a kid. And this is what I found out. I found out that the recipe for this candy has been sold several times through the years. And every time it's sold, it changes just a little bit. Because at one point in time, they, they, they said, you know, I, I don't think people have the patience to enjoy it over time anymore. So every time they change the recipe, they make it a little bit softer. And now you eat an hour and later, and it's hard to tell the difference between it and something like a Laffy Taffy. I imagine it'll disappear completely soon. Now here's, here's how that helps us understand the kingdom. The kingdom has a very unique texture. The first experience that you have with it, if you're not used to it, it's, it can be interesting, it can be different, it can feel really, really hard or difficult. But the more you chew on it, the softer it becomes, the more you enjoy its flavor, the more you enjoy its, let's say, fruitfulness, and the more of it that you want. But like the candy, it was never designed to be fully consumed now. We are fully in the kingdom now. But when it comes to enjoying all of the benefits of the kingdom, what we're meant to have now is a taste. Just a, a taste that is meant to build our anticipation for the full experience of the kingdom that is to come. That, that's, that's how God designed the kingdom. It's, it's both now and later. And listen, I wanted to do this series because I know we can have some heavy series, some, some convicting series, and those are good. But there's also times when it's, it's okay to just sit back and, and realize, listen, I, I'm blessed. When the world is difficult, it's sometimes it's okay to say, I'm, I'm blessed. And to remember that, that we're blessed and, and that's what changed our life, not our life needs to change to get blessings. Because here's, here's what happens in my family. I don't know a better time of the year to do something like this because I, I want to give you something to be thankful and grateful for because I'm going to go home for Thanksgiving and I'm going to see my family and we're all going to have to sit around that stupid giant table and go around and every single one of us say what we're thankful for. And so I wanted to do this because if that's your family and you're here today and you don't feel like you have much to be thankful for and you don't want to go because you don't want to have to, to do that stupid thing, you don't want to have to tell people you're, you're thankful or grateful because you don't even want to feel happy right now. Listen, if that's you, this, this message is for you because here's the things that you can tell your family. You can say, I'm blessed. I am blessed now. I am in Jesus' forgiveness now. No matter what I'm struggling with now, he has forgiven me. He forgave me yesterday. He forgives me today. He forgives me tomorrow. His grace is like the air I breathe. It will never run out. There's nothing I can ever do that will change the way he feels about me or thinks about me or what he did for me. I'm blessed now. And despite what my life looks like, despite what my behavior and, and my heart says, despite all, all of, of the things that I change to try to serve God and how my life looks like it's not blessed, how it looks like I have these curses, how it looks like I'm struggling. Listen, I'm still blessed because I'm blessed now and I'm blessed later. It may not look like it now, but I have assurance that when Jesus comes back, oh boy, does it pay off because my blessings are now and they're later. So it may not look like there's a lot going on. It may not look good to your perspective, but it's good because I'm blessed. So that's what I wanna leave you with today. Remember that you are forgiven. Remember you are loved. Remember you are blessed. And let that be your motivation every day when you wake up for righteous living. To be the person that has far-sighted vision and a near-sighted world. Because Jesus does love you. And what he did for you, he finished that work. Now our work's not done. But his is. So we get to walk in that freedom and grace and mercy love and we get to be free people and when we sit around that table if it's Christians it's resonate and if it's not my friends that's a light in a dark world that's hope that's being a peacekeeper it's being a peacemaker and it's bringing Jesus where he has the right to be 
So that's what I'm asking you to do this Thanksgiving, to be thankful, to be grateful, and to walk in your blessing. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you that, God, even when it seems like the world is not receptive, and when it seems like my, my life isn't receptive, when it seems like my flesh is winning, God, when it, when it seems like the trials and the burdens of this life are just too much, God, I thank you that you're not just enough for us, that you're more than enough for us. I thank you that you're our living water. I thank you that you spring forth out of us and that you bless others because you're in us. And God, I, I thank you that this season, more than anything else, we've already taken communion today, God, but you didn't have to do what you did and you chose to. You chose to set us free. You chose to take the penalty. You chose to bless us when we didn't deserve it. And so God, as, as we come to this time of worship, as we experience conviction, God, let it move us into right living. Let, us, let it move us into righteousness. Let us give us the hope that even if we struggle in that process, that your grace is still enough, but you are worth our life. You are worth our living. You are worth us waking up to love you and serve you and to bring light into a dark world. God, you earned that just by being who you are. You commissioned us with your life. So we give ours back to you in return. It's in Jesus' name.